it's good to be at Valley Church. It's been a few years since I've been here and uh, worked out to be here this weekend. So Marcel has asked me several times if you're in the area, come and uh, share with us. And so glad, glad to be able to, to do that today. I uh, came out for a, a rather uh, somber reason. A good friend of Marcel and mine passed away, Stan Powers, who many of you know, passed away this past week. And uh, uh, we were honoring him on Friday and it was a great, great time to honor uh, but I've been uh, hanging out in Hebrews chapter 12 for the past couple of weeks as I have, uh, even before Stan passed away, I was just in that part of the Bible. And so what I want to share with you today is not a Father's Day message, but it's uh, something I think that's uh, relevant for all of us today. So I've entitled my message, Embrace Your Race. I know that in North Vancouver, you can run or jog all year long but not so much on the prairies. Uh, in Calgary, we have eight months of winter and four months of poor sledding. So uh, the joggers kind of peter out you know, towards the, the colder months, and then one of the first signs of spring in Calgary is that all the joggers and all the runners are, are out. Now, I'm not a runner, and, and the reason I'm not a runner is, the, is, is theological. In Proverbs 28 and verse one, it says, the wicked run when no one is chasing them. <laughs> So when you see all those people running on the streets, you have to ask yourself, why are they running? <laughs> Although we're not runners, uh, Lois and I have participated in something called the Run for the Cure because uh, we want to support the Breast Cancer Society's fundraising process. You see, the reason is Lois is a two-time breast cancer survivor, and uh, we have, want to support the cause of breast cancer. So each year, we gather with thousands of people uh, in cities across Canada and run, jog, or walk uh, for breast cancer research. Over the past 19 years, uh, Lois has personally raised over $35,000 for breast cancer research in Canada, so good for her. Uh, but one of the many corporate sponsorships of the Run for the Cure is the Running Room. And I think there's one located here in North Vancouver as well. The Running Room is a retail facility, it's a running club, and they also publish a magazine about running. And because of our involvement with the Run for the Cure, they send us their magazine. And I like to leave it on my coffee table so that people think I am a runner. You know, just, <laughs> just kind of want them to think that, you know. But I want to tell you, the people that publish this magazine are absolutely fanatics about running. Are there any runners here? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit it now, right? <laughs> you know, some people run marathons. That's 26 miles. Like, that's like running from here to Surrey. I mean, that's crazy. But there are people who do that for a hobby. Notwithstanding my theological reason for not running, it seems like God is into running. And if you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to read the first three verses of that chapter as we begin this morning. Paul, it's nice that you're here today. Nice to see you. Yeah. Did I bump you this morning? <laughs> no. <laughs> Paul said, or the writer of the Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In the New Testament, on several occasions, the Christian life is compared to running a race. Every Christian has a race, and they all lead to the same destination, but we all have different routes that we are taking. The race that God has set out for me is different than the race God has set out for Marcel, and it's different than the race that God has set out for Paul. The very first words of that text are, therefore. And my boyhood pastor, Lauren Pritchard, who used to preach here years ago, once in a while, used to say, whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, find out why it's therefore. And you see, therefore always refers us back to something previous that was said. So in this case, it refers us back to the previous chapter, to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. So let's turn there and uh, read a couple of verses there. This is the chapter we often call the chapters of the heroes of faith. The writer says, what more shall we say? 
I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, women received back their dead, raised to life again. And there were others. Can you say others? There were others who were tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and lived in caves and in holes in the ground. And then these were all, can you say all? All commended for their faith. Both, both the ones who did the great exploits and the ones who went around destitute were all commended for their faith. Same faith, different outcomes. Each one of these heroes of the faith had a race to run. Each one was different. But they are all commended for running the race that the race designer set out for them. All of us have a race to run. Now, we've all heard stories about someone who's received the diagnosis of cancer, and they pray, and their friends pray, and their church prays, and they go back to the doctor, and the doctor runs some more tests, and the doctor says, I can't explain this, but there's no more cancer here. We've heard those kind of stories, right? But we've also heard stories about someone who gets the very same diagnosis and they pray and their friends pray and their church prays and they go back to the doctor for further tests and the cancer is confirmed and they undergo treatment but the cancer is aggressive and six months later we're at their funeral. Same faith, different outcomes. Pastor Jamie Buckingham once said, uh, in these situations, this side of heaven, there's no concrete answers as to why some are healed and some are not, other than to say we're running different races. We're called to embrace the race that God has set before us. I can't tell you why some great parents have prodigal children. can't tell you why some families seem to have more than their fair share of financial setbacks. I can't tell why some people deal with chronic health issues or mental illness. You see, faith doesn't make the race easier, but faith makes us stronger so that we can run the race that God sets out for us. John chapter 21, that's the chapter where Jesus has the dialogue with Peter about, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. You know that part. A little later on in that conversation, Jesus says to Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And the scripture says this was indicative of the kind of martyrdom that Peter would suffer one day. And it says that Peter saw John, the disciple John, standing a ways away. And when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? But you must follow me. I think what Jesus was saying to Peter is, John has a different race than you do, Peter. You don't need to worry about John's race. You need to worry about your race. That's why Paul says we're unwise when we compare ourselves one with another, because we're all running different races. You know, on on any racetrack, there are lanes for each runner to run in. And it's important that you stay in your own lane. Because if you start looking over at the person next to you, you're going to start wandering into their lane. But you see, there's no grace for running someone else's race, but there is grace for running your race. When I was pastor at North Edmonton Christian Fellowship, and Veronica is here today, and Joe, Veronica came to know the Lord when we were in Edmonton, and uh, she lives here in North Van, so I sent her notes at preaching at Lynn Valley this morning. So her and her husband, Joe, are here. Good to have you guys here. Anyways, when I was pastor in Edmonton, two of our young fathers were involved in a tragic car accident. One was killed and one survived. As you can imagine, this shook our whole church, reminded us of the brevity of life, reminded us that none of us are guaranteed another breath. But it also reminded us that Bob's race was over and Ted's race carried on. 
And I remember a lady from the church coming to me a few months after the accident and saying to me, Pastor, I can't believe how well Carolyn's doing. Carolyn was the widow. I can't believe how well she's doing uh, in light of what she's just been through. She said, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know that if that happened to me, I don't think I could handle it. I said to her, you know what, you're probably right. Because that's not the race that God has you running. God will give you grace for your race, and he's giving Carolyn grace for her race. You see, grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling me to be who God's created me to be, and to do what God's called me to do. It seems that in life, some of us get to run on a nice, level, even, smooth course. And others of us find ourselves running on a hilly course, where it's kind of up and down, and there's lots of highs and lows in life. And other people seem to be running up the side of a mountain, just really a steep race. And I can't tell you why your course is the way it is, but I want you to know that God will always give you grace for your race. For whatever turn, whatever direction, whatever steps your race takes you on, God will give you grace for your race. So we need to embrace the race that God has called us to run. Number two, we need to run light, run free, and run hard. First of all, run light. When I was in high school, a friend of mine by the name of Jim was really into track and field, and in particular into running. And one day, Jim showed up at a track meet with a brand new pair of running shoes. They were called Aztec Gold Adidas. They were the lightest track shoe that you could buy. They were the shoe of choice for the Olympic runners at the 1968 Olympics. Now, technology's probably moved on a bit since then. But these Aztec gold runners were made of such soft leather and had almost no sole, and they were very light. And and they would only last a few races because the cleats would begin to tear away from from the leather. They were expensive. They cost $50 in 1972. (laughs) And in today's dollars, that's probably $300, or, you know, with inflation, now we're probably up to $350 this week. But... uh, (laughs) And you need to know that Jim was from a single-parent home. And he bought these with money that he earned by his, from his paper route. Why would Jim make such an investment? Because he wanted to lay aside everything that would slow him down and hinder him in the races that he was running. And that's what Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know, there are things that we can become involved in that are not wrong and they're not sinful, but they can impede us in our race. Let me suggest some things to you. First of all, some relationships. Some relationships, whether they're business, personal, or romantic, can weigh us down and not allow us to run our race with with efficiency. We're weighted down by those things. Sometimes it's possessions. Now, we all own things, but sometimes what I own owns a part of me. There's nothing wrong with owning things, but when something owns a part of me, uh, it begins to have a Uh, 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 an impedance on the race that I'm running. So sometimes it owns my time because I have to maintain it. And sometimes it owns a piece of my future income because I've committed to payments for the next five years. Possessions can sometimes weigh us down on the race that we're running. Another one is pleasure. I believe that God wants us to enjoy life and Christians are not called to be ascetics. But constantly seeking after pleasure or leisure can become an impedance in the race that we're running. So what is it that hinders you? Is there something that keeps you from running at full speed? Secondly, we need to run free. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us strip off every way that holds us down, especially the sin that trips us up. So there are things that slow us down in the race, that impede our progress, but sin trips us up. We're all prone to sin. John said, 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. None of us are immune to sin, but there is a solution. First John 1 John 1.9, we must confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, as I was reflecting on this passage, and if you want to flip back to that uh, one picture before, you notice that uh, his shoelaces are untied. And I thought, you know, when we're trying to run the race with sin in our lives, it's like running with your shoes untied. You're either going to trip over your shoelace or you're going to lose your shoe. (laughs) So running the race with sin in our lives is, uh, is not a good idea. Regardless of the race that we've been, that's been set before us, we need to run light, we need to run free, and thirdly, we need to run hard. Verse 
Hebrews 12 once says, let us run with endurance the races that God has set before us. You know, in this running room magazine that I mentioned earlier, I've discovered that people who are into running are really serious about nutrition, hydration, and stretching. And if we're going to run the race that God has set before us with endurance, we need to pay attention to those same things. We need to nourish ourselves with the word of God. We need to hydrate ourselves with the living water of the Holy Spirit, and we need to stretch our faith. And just like physical stretching, spiritual stretching is not easy. Stretching requires us to push beyond what our normal comfort zone is. If the race is in the race that God has set before you, he may want to stretch your faith in lots of different ways. He may want you to do something that you've never done before. He might want you to give more than you've ever given before. He might want you to say something to somebody that you've never said before. He might want you to sell something. He might want you to start something, a ministry. He might want you to love someone that's not very lovable. Those things all stretch our faith. To embrace the race that God has set before us, regardless of the course that we're running, we need to run light, run free, and run hard. Number three, we need to welcome the witnesses. Hebrews 12, 1, it says, We are surrounded by a great company of witnesses, or a great crowd of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? Well, it's the heroes of the faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. The writer here is not talking about these heroes of the faith as heavenly spectators leaning over the portals of heaven watching us run the race. This cloud of witnesses is not witnesses of us, but witnesses to us. Let me illustrate it this way. Now, this is a Calgary Flames thing, and I know it's a little sore spot around here for the Canucks this year. Anybody, anybody see the, the game last night? Thunder Bay got, or uh, Tampa Bay got thrashed seven to nothing <laughs> by Colorado. And I cheer for the Oilers still, uh, so I'm feeling pretty good that it's the Colorado team that beat the Oilers and they're going to beat Tampa Bay. Anyways, and that's an aside. A few years ago, the Calgary Flames retired Jerome Aginla's jersey. And this, of course, was to honor his outstanding play in the NHL for the past 16 years. And his number, number 12, now hangs in the rafters of the Saddle Dome. And number 12 will never be worn again by another Calgary Flames player. At the ceremony, when they put his uh, jersey up into the rafters, Uh, Jerome said that when he said, when I first played in the saddle, the first game I played in the saddle dome, I looked up and there was the jersey of Lanny McDonald hanging in the rafters. And he said, I was just in awe that I was playing in the same building in the same league that the great Lanny McDonald had played in. He said, the first year in the league, when we would travel to other NHL arenas, he said, I'd look up into the rafters and see whose jerseys were hanging in the rafters. He said, sometimes I didn't know these guys, so I'd ask some of our older coaches or trainers and say, what position did they play? What did he accomplish? What made him worthy of this honor? You see, wherever he played, he was surrounded by a great company of witnesses who had gone before him, and he was now allowed, he was now following their play. And and he was allowing their play and their past exploits to motivate him to play at the level he was playing. And the same is true for us. We are surrounded by a great company of witnesses who have gone before us. The heroes of the faith that we mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. And then we all probably have some personal heroes. Some of mine would be Lorne Pritchard, Frank Kosick, Glenn McLean, Alan Mortensen, Daniel Breen, and now Stan Powers are witnesses that have gone on before, that have led a life and have lived a model of life that I want to emulate, that I want to let inspire me, that I want to allow me to run my race with the same tenacity that they ran theirs. So we need to allow the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us to inspire us and to encourage us in the race that God has set out for us. And then finally, we need to turn our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. While we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who've ran the race before us, the real champion is Jesus. Jesus ran the most difficult race that anyone has ever ran. You know, the Greek word for running is agon, And it's the same word that we get our English word agony from. 
Jesus endured the agony of the cross. He endured the physical agony of the cross, the flogging, the crown of thorns, the nails, the piercing of his side. He also endured the spiritual agony of the cross. You know, we all know what it's like to fall into sin, and uh, we know the guilt that we can feel when, we're, when we've sinned. The Bible tells us that God placed on Jesus all of the sin and all of the guilt of all humanity on the one who'd never known what sin was like. Can you imagine the agony that that created in him spiritually? He endured the emotional agony of being rejected by his closest friends. He endured the shame of the cross, hanging naked for all the world to see so that we might be clothed in his righteousness. And finally, he endured the rejection of his father when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. You see, the joy set before Jesus was crossing the finish line. And he knew that on the other side of the cross was resurrection, but not just his resurrection. He knew that crossing the finish line would enable him to bring many sons and daughters into glory. The writer of the Hebrew con concludes this passage by saying, Consider him. That means think about him. Reflect on him. Ponder him. Who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. Let Jesus be your inspiration. Let Jesus be your role model. Let Jesus be the model that you follow. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back at this time. I just have some questions that I want to ask you as we kind of tie this together and wrap it up this morning. I want to ask you, have you embraced your race? God has a unique race for every one of us to run. I trust that you're not allowing yourself be dis to be distracted by the races that other people are running. How are you doing about embracing your race? Secondly, how's the race going? Maybe you're on a flat part of the race and things are going pretty good. You're running along, not many obstacles. Maybe there's others of you who today feel like you're running uphill. <laughs> it's really steep these days. There's lots of struggles and lots of challenges in the race that you're running. But I want you to know this, God will give you grace for your race. I want to ask you, is there anything that's slowing you down in your race? Maybe there's some hindrances that are impeding your progress. Regardless of what they are, we need to get rid of them so that we can run light. Have you been trying to run your race with your shoes untied? If there's unconfessed sin in your life, I just want to urge you to deal with it today. Jesus said, if we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Have you been neglecting your training regime? The nourishment of the word, the water of the spirit, the stretching of our faith are all essential in order for to run with endurance. And finally, have you fixed your eyes on Jesus? He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. He's the inspiration. He's our ultimate example. Would you stand together with me? One last thing about you guys want to start to play, that'd be great. One last thing about uh, running the race is that we don't do it alone. We never do it alone. Jesus said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He will be with us every step of the way. If you've never entered into the Christian race, if you've never made a decision to become a follower of Jesus, you can do that today, and I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Maybe somebody here today got a diagnosis from a doctor this week that has just caused your race to get a little more difficult. I'd be happy to pray with you today. Maybe you're uh, struggling with some things in life. Maybe there's some addictions. Maybe there's some things in your life that you just need to break free in order to be running the, with freedom. Uh, Jesus will help you with that. He'll set you free. Maybe uh, you're here and there's sin in your life you just need to deal with. I just encourage you to just deal with it with God. Just make it right with God. Keep short accounts with God and uh, be, be on track.